Thyroid cancer is the most common malignant tumor of the endocrine system. The National Cancer Institute estimated that in 2010, 45,000 new cases of thyroid cancer were diagnosed in the United States. Thyroid cancer could be divided into poorly differentiated and differentiated thyroid carcinoma. The poorly differentiated medullary and anaplastic thyroid cancers account for approximately 3% of thyroid cancer cases and tend to be very aggressive and usually have a poor prognosis. Papillary and follicular thyroid cancers are differentiated tumors derived from the follicular cells of the thyroid and account for approximately 97% of thyroid cancer cases. These are highly treatable and curable cancers. In these cancers, measurement of thyroglobulin levels is considered a standard of practice for patient follow-up. The treatment of differentiated thyroid cancer consists of total removal of the thyroid gland followed by radioactive iodine treatment to destroy any remaining healthy thyroid tissue as well as microscopic areas of thyroid cancer that were not removed during surgery. Because of the good prognosis of the majority of patients with differentiated thyroid cancer, measurement of thyroglobulin has emerged as a non-invasive and cost-effective follow-up tool to monitor recurrent and persistent disease. Thyroglobulin is a 660,000 molecular weight glycoprotein produced exclusively by the follicular cells of the thyroid. It is secreted into the follicular lumen, where it serves as the precursor of and storage reservoir for the thyroid hormones T4 and T3. T4 and T3 are released after thyroglobulin is endocytosed and proteolytically degraded into the thyrocyte. Small amounts of intact thyroglobulin are secreted alongside T4 and T3 and are detectable in the serum of normal individuals with levels roughly paralleling thyroid size. The concentration of serum thyroglobulin increases substantially due to follicular destruction through inflammation, such as in the cases of thyroiditis and autoimmune hypothyroidism, or rapid disorder growth of thyroid tissue, as might be observed in grave disease or follicular self-derived thyroid neoplasms. Thyroglobulin measurement is not recommended for the screening or the initial diagnosis of thyroid cancer due to the significant overlap found between the levels observed in benign thyroid diseases and those in thyroid cancer patients. In addition, in patients with small cancers, thyroglobulin levels might overlap with the levels seen in normal individuals. The primary use of serum thyroglobulin measurement is in the follow-up of patients with differentiated thyroid cancer following total thyroidectomy and radioactive iodine ablation. The American Thyroid Association guidelines for the management of differentiated thyroid cancer suggest that athyroidic thyroid cancer patients should have unstimulated serum thyroglobulin concentrations equal or less to 2 nanograms per milliliter. Patients with higher levels should be investigated for persistent or recurrent disease. Furthermore, athyroidic thyroid cancer patients with unstimulated or stimulated serum thyroglobulin concentrations greater than 10 nanograms per milliliter are likely to have evidence of persistent or recurrent disease. For patients with small thyroid remnants, there are not currently universally accepted cutoffs for thyroglobulin. It has been suggested that thyroglobulin levels should not exceed approximately 0.5 nanograms per mil per gram of remnant tissue in patients with a suppressed TSH or approximately 1 nanogram per mil per gram of remnant tissue if the TSH is equal or greater than 0.1 milliIUs per liter. Most laboratories perform thyroglobulin measurements by automated non-competitive immunometric assays. The clinical utility of thyroglobulin testing can be negatively affected by various analytical issues. Interference caused by antithyroglobulin autoantibodies remains the most serious problem limiting the clinical utility of thyroglobulin testing. Antithyroglobulin autoantibodies are detected in up to 30% of patients with differentiated thyroid cancer, compared with the 10% incidence reported for the general population. Antithyroglobulin antibody interference 
is characterized by undetectable or low theroglobulin levels using immunometric assays. Due to this problem, various practice guidelines, including those from the National Academy of Clinical Biochemistry and the American Thyroid Association, stress that antitheroglobulin autoantibodies should be measured on all samples tested for thyroglobulin. Failure to detect thyroglobulin antibody interference in the presence of an undetectable thyroglobulin value could greatly impact patient management as disease recurrence might go undiagnosed. Screening for thyroglobulin antibodies should be performed by immunoassay methods and not by a recovery test. It is now widely recognized that recovery tests are an unreliable means for detecting interfering antithyroglobulin antibodies. Thyroglobulin antibodies and thyroglobulin show mutual interference in their immunoassays. As shown in the panel on the left, in a typical immunometric thyroglobulin assay, the thyroglobulin present in the patient's serum is sandwiched between a capture and a detection antibody. In the presence of thyroglobulin antibody, binding of thyroglobulin can be prevented by blocking the access of the capture and or the binding antibody to the respective epitopes on thyroglobulin. This will result in a falsely low level of thyroglobulin. The right panel shows the effect of high amounts of thyroglobulin in the measurement of thyroglobulin autoantibodies. In the thyroglobulin autoantibody immunometric assay, the thyroglobulin antibodies present in the patient's serum will bind to immobilized thyroglobulin and are detected by anti-human IgG detection antibodies. Thyroglobulin in the patient's serum might sequester the thyroglobulin autoantibodies, making them unavailable to bind the immobilized thyroglobulin. The detection antibodies will still bind the thyroglobulin autoantibodies, but complexes will not be captured, resulting in a falsely low thyroglobulin antibody value. In contrast, if a competitive assay is used for thyroglobulin autoantibody detection, high concentrations of thyroglobulin could result in falsely elevated thyroglobulin antibody levels. Another type of analytical interference is caused by the presence of heterophile antibodies, which are human antibodies that can bind to animal-derived antibodies used in immunoassays. Heterophile antibodies are a potential problem for all immunometric assays. These antibodies will most frequently interact with the capture and or the label antibody simulating the presence of analyte, in this case thyroglobulin and can create a falsely elevated result even when thyroglobulin is absent in the sample. A study in 2003 by Preissner et al. detected heterophile interference in approximately 3% of specimens tested for thyroglobulin. Despite the manufacturer's efforts to overcome this problem, some patient specimens still exhibit heterophile interference in thyroglobulin immunoassays. In situations where an elevated thyroglobulin level does not fit the clinical picture, the laboratory should be contacted for evaluation of possible heterophile interference. Hook effect in immunometric thyroglobulin assays occurs when very high concentrations of thyroglobulin saturate both the capture and the detection antibody, preventing the formation of the antibody complex and resulting in a falsely low thyroglobulin level. The fourth issue concerning thyroglobulin measurement is assay standardization. A thyroglobulin reference preparation was introduced in 1996, and current thyroglobulin methods claim to be standardized to this preparation. However, a study of six currently available CRM457 standardized methods found an approximately two-fold difference in mean thyroglobulin levels in a cohort of 68 euthyroid TG antibody negative control individuals. This highlights the fact that thyroglobulin values should not be compared amongst different assays for thyroid cancer follow-up. Moreover, the ATA guidelines emphasize that the same thyroglobulin assay should be employed over time in individual patients. If a change in the method is necessary, rebaselining of the individual patients should be performed.
More recently, the measurement of thyroglobulin in fine needle aspirate biopsy needle washing from lymph nodes is becoming a common practice to assist in the diagnosis of thyroid cancer metastasis. The introduction of this practice has been driven by the fact that depending on the institution, 10 to 20% of FNAB cytologies are non-diagnostic. Measurement of thyroglobulin in FNAB needle washes has been shown to have comparable diagnostic performance than cytology, and it is also diagnostic in most cases with a non-diagnostic cytology. Another advantage of measuring thyroglobulin in the fine needle aspirate biopsy washes is that it is unaffected by the presence of thyroglobulin autoantibodies. The advantage of performing thyroglobulin measurement in FNAB washes is that the cytological examination and the measurement of thyroglobulin can be performed on the same specimen. To measure thyroglobulin, the FNA needle is rinsed with a small amount of saline solution immediately after the sample for cytological examination has been expelled from the needle for a smear preparation. Thyroglobulin levels are measured in the needle wash. Interpretation of the results should be based in the laboratory-established clinical decision limits. In our institution, we use a thyroglobulin value of 1 nanogram per mil based on a collection volume of 1 to 1.5 milliliters. Values above 1 nanogram per mil are considered positive for the presence of thyroid cancer in the biopsied lymph node. The thyroglobulin cutoff should be dependent on the collection volume, and laboratories should provide guidance on how the specimen should be collected based on their assay validation. In clinical practice, thyroglobulin autoantibodies are used in the diagnosis of thyroid autoimmune diseases and to assess the reliability of the thyroglobulin measurement in thyroid cancer follow-up. In patients with autoimmune hypothyroidism, approximately 70% will have detectable antithyroglobulin antibodies, while up to 90% will have detectable antithyroperoxidase autoantibodies. In Graves' disease, about 30% of patients will have detectable thyroglobulin autoantibodies. On both of these situations, measurement of thyroglobulin autoantibodies is useful as an aid in the diagnosis of thyroid autoimmune disease. In thyroid cancer, as discussed earlier, thyroglobulin autoantibodies interfere in thyroglobulin immunometric assays, resulting in falsely low levels of thyroglobulin. In patients that are thyroglobulin autoantibodies positive, serial measurement of the antibodies may be useful as a prognostic indicator. Thyroglobulin autoantibody concentrations gradually decline in cure atheriotic patients. Patients that do not show a gradual decline in serum thyroglobulin autoantibodies concentration following treatment have a significant likelihood of residual or recurrent disease. All FDA-approved thyroglobulin autoantibody assays are aimed for the aid in the diagnosis of thyroid autoimmune diseases, and as such, the majority of them can only detect relatively high thyroglobulin autoantibodies concentration and could meet significant thyroglobulin autoantibody interferences in the thyroglobulin assay. Furthermore, because of the poor numerical agreement between the thyroglobulin autoantibody assays in any given sample, it is very difficult to determine the minimal level of thyroglobulin antibody that is likely to cause interference in the thyroglobulin assay. In addition, the manufacturer-provider diagnostic cutoff are not optimized for the detection of interference in thyroglobulin assays, and values within the normal range could still cause significant interference. Ideally, each laboratory should establish the value of thyroglobulin autoantibodies that interfere in the respective thyroglobulin assays. This figure shows a method comparison between four different thyroglobulin antibody assays using 100 samples. In the x-axis, the beckman coulter autoantibody assay was used as the reference method, and the status of the thyroglobulin antibody, whether they were positive or negative, was based on this method. Unfortunately, this method has recently become unavailable. The other assays tested were the Siemens Immulite, the Roche Alexis, 
and the semen center paroglobulin antibody assays. The poor correlation between the assays is clear from the regression analysis with correlation coefficients ranging from 0.05 to 0.3 and slopes ranging from 1.7 to 12. This means that patients will have very discordant results and a patient considered thyroglobulin autoantibody negative in one assay may be considered thyroglobulin autoantibody positive with another assay. This could potentially affect patient management as clinicians may be confused if there is a significant difference in the thyroglobulin antibody values when patients are being followed up over time. Furthermore, laboratories will have to determine the level of thyroglobulin antibody that cause interference with each of different assays. To summarize, thyroglobulin is a thyroid-specific marker that has become a standard of practice in the follow-up of patients with differentiated thyroid cancer after total thyroidectomy. As a tumor marker, thyroglobulin lacks specificity since it could be upregulated in benign thyroid diseases and as such should not be used in the initial diagnosis of thyroid cancer. The presence of thyroglobulin autoantibodies in up to 30% of thyroid cancer patients is problematic as they interfere in the thyroglobulin immunometric assays. It is very important that each thyroglobulin measurement has a thyroglobulin value associated with it to determine the accuracy of the result. If thyroglobulin autoantibodies are present, then the clinician should be alerted to recognize that the thyroglobulin result might be unreliable, especially if the value is undetectable.